we have fun around here, don't we, guys? Well, our next guest has quite the resume. She was a producer on The Late Show with David Letterman, co-creator of The Daily Show, and helped discover Jon Stewart, Stephen Colbert, and Steve Carell. You know, just, just, just to name a few. But her true passion is cooking. Please welcome to our show, I'm so excited, Madeline Smithberg. Hi, Madeline. Hi, Jason. Okay. I, I don't know if the producers warned you, but I'm such a TV geek that you're this. I've looked forward to this interview. I, I, I couldn't wait. I woke up this morning and I thought Madeline Smithberg. I'm not joking. That was my first thought this morning. <laughs> that was my first thought too. But it was a little bit <laughs> well, we're going to get cooking. Who we're, am I? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get cooking a little bit later, but um, I, I always say Madeline, I had a couple north, uh, several North stars for broadcasting. I had Johnny, and I had Dave, and I had Oprah and Stern. When when I say Letterman to you, I'm sure you have a blender full of memories. But what usually floats to the top? What's one of the first things you think about when you think of your years with Dave? First of all, when I think of my years with Dave, I break out into a gigantic smile. Uh, I was there for six years, 86 to 92. It was actually at late night. Late night, yeah. Letterman at NBC. And I call it my graduate school because it was like boot camp for TV production. I always used to say that the clocks in Greenwich where they do the meantime are set by when Dave lo loads his audience. Everything is perfect, but I love Dave. I loved every second. It was a weird time in my life where it was just the perfect job for me. And I, it was it was tough because mistakes were not accepted, but it was also very loving. And uh, Dave and I had a great relationship. And for me, I'm like you. I saw the show and I didn't have the reaction you would have to entertainment. For me, it was a calling. Yeah. I saw yep. late night and I thought I must be a part of this and I made it happen and it took two years and it was just phenomenal. I, I feel very much the same way and you know what I think it, it was lost on the younger generation is you know and Dave doesn't like compliments as you know but you guys and you're included because uh, I, I feel very lucky to talk to you you guys really did change late night because people forget you know Johnny created that format the band the monologue you come you sit down and Johnny had a very specific type of guest but you guys kind of flipped it. You introduced irony. You introduced, you know, now everybody talks to their crew, but you guys started that. Did you know you were changing the format? Did you know you were flipping it upside down? Yeah, I think that more than flipping it upside down was we consciously took it apart and then twisted every single element just a tiny bit. So it was almost like a D constructed late night talk show. Uh, and then obviously it was a comedy show through and through uh, and happened to be a talk show because Dave didn't really love talking to famous people. He loved doing the comedy and then he loved what I did. I was the human interest uh, booker and producer. So I had to scour the United States of America and occasionally Canada and England for people who had comedic potential but did not know it yeah. without the internet. I, ha I read 35 local papers a day. I scouted state fairs and little tiny fairs, <laughs> like the Gourd Festival. And uh, he loved my segments because it was the only part of the show where he was actually off book. He didn't want to be prepped. He didn't rehearse. It was just you saw the magic of Dave in the moment, and it never ceased to just impress me. And, and the guy was genius. He is genius. He is genius. And and you didn't stop there. The Daily Show. I mean, Madeline, we could just go to the first part of your resume and that would be fantastic. But then The Daily Show. I mean, uh, yeah. Well, you're... I was kind of recruited by Comedy Central to create a Daily Show, <laughs> uh, a job that I turned down for about nine months and then finally just gave in out of just exhaustion. Uh, Doug Herzog just kept on hammering me to do it. And I didn't want to. It had been in, you know, strip television with Letterman. And then we did the Jon Stewart show on MTV. And I was, I wanted to have a family. I didn't, I was like Kellyanne Conway. I didn't want to be on a strip show. 
Uh, but I got coerced and the rest, as they say, is history. And uh, yeah, that was an amazing ride as well. Okay. A very lucky girl. Well, yeah, and then now there's another chapter because all of you watching, if you're wondering why, why Madeline is standing there in the kitchen with a whole bunch of food, she has another skill, another thing she's fantastic uh, with. And when we come back, you're going to discover that right after this. Stay with us, everyone. We're back uh, with one. Oh, I'm loving this. I told our producer I could have. I can talk to Madeline for 47 minutes here. Madeline Smithberg, who runs the cooking blog Mad in the Kitchen, and Madeline's been nice enough uh, to stick with us a little bit longer. A little bit later, you're going to find out the story of the magician Madeline and a fire. A little bit later. I love it. I can't. <laughs> okay, so cooking, Madeline. I mean, were you always okay. interested in this? Yeah, it's something that started when I was 12 years old. My parents took me to Europe and I ate something in France that just <laughs> literally changed my life forever. And from that moment on, I wake up every morning obsessing about what I'm going to cook that day, which is terrible for me, but great for everyone around me. <laughs> and I moved to Seattle, where I am right now, three years ago, uh, to be with the love of my life. And... Uh, there's not a lot of TV here. So I, I somehow segued into being a chef, teaching uh, corporate team building events, and uh, <laughs> it was awesome. And then when the pandemic struck, I turned on my phone and just started shooting myself cooking. But there was kind of a great irony because I produced all the cooking segments on Letterman, and now I produce me. Oh, Madeline, uh, Madeline, can I tell you, in right before we came to you, you're going to love this, right before we, you came to me, or we, we went to you, my producer Ted said, get ready. This is the best produced Zoom interview we will ever do in the history of our show. And I said, well, <laughs> what do you expect? She's a producer. It's hilarious. It's almost like some sort of divine retribution because now I have to like give myself notes and plan my <laughs> beginning, middle and end. <laughs> it's kind of revenge. Uh, so today I'm making something super simple and super delicious. It's summer. Uh, what do we have an abundance of besides zucchini, which I cannot grow. We'll get to that another time. <laughs> we have stone fruits. We have tomatoes. This is my first tomato from my garden. Look at that, Madeline. I suck at gardening. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a caprese, which is mozzarella. It's a fresh mozzarella with tomato, basil, and stone fruits. It's so delicious. It's just a simple twist and it makes it so much better. Now, if I were cooking for people, I would wear gloves, Yeah, but I'm not. <laughs> so okay. I'm going to use my hands and you're not going to give me any crap. So I've laid out a bed of tomatoes, which is not very comfortable, but it is delicious. Okay. And I'm, ju I'm just going <laughs> to slap some mozzarella on there uh in a pretty pattern because food is also better when it's visually appealing yeah. uh except in the case of a uh hot dog that we don't really care what <laughs> it looks like and then i've got my stone fruits and what i have here is a white nectarine a plum and something called a cherry plum and then I've got some cherries. You know, we're really excited about our cherries here in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Probably because we don't have theater. But I guess <laughs> nobody has theater right now. So now I'm laying some did of you, my... Madeline, uh, did you just say that cherries are a theater replacement? It is. You gotta go. You gotta go. You know, you milk your assets. <laughs> yes. Just sort of, you play to your strengths. That's yeah. what we do. So I'm just doing a mix of all the different stone fruits. And if this were on my uh, YouTube channel, Mad in the Kitchen, I would shoot it and then Sky Gleason, who uh, set up my switcher here, uh, would speed it up in post. But we don't have that option, so I'm just trying to move really quickly and still have it be beautiful. Now I lie, put my cherries on there and I'm going to add my basil. I just plop the basil on, uh, which is very nice. And then, Little olive oil, extra virgin. I like unfiltered. Yeah. That's about it. A uh, little salt, not too much, but enough 
to counteract the sweetness of the stone fruit. And then this is one of my secret ingredients. It's a balsamic reduction or glaze. Yeah. And it's really good and sweet. And you just do a little of that. And oh, Madeline, that looks re- that looks real good, Madeline. It's amazing. <laughs> yes. Toast up a little focaccia, and you have yourself a perfect summer, either uh, lunch or even dinner. Well, I, 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 I'm this is I'm loving life right now. I'm, I'm having more fun than I've had in weeks. Madeline is not going anywhere, but if you want to see more of her in the kitchen, and I know you do, madinthekitchen.com is the address. She's staying there. You're staying there. When we come back, The Magician, The Fire, and Dave, next. Welcome back, everyone. More with Madeline. Again, madinthekitchen.com. Go on it right now uh, and support Madeline. Okay, we have to go back to a story. You, I mean, uh, you, could write a, uh, you could write an encyclopedia of great stories from, from Dave. Tell me about the magician. Okay. You know, I've had a long career with a lot of highlights and lowlights, and this is one where they actually both converged in one moment. Uh, I used to book and uh, produce the segments with Kmar, the magician who we called Kmar the discount magician. (laughs) And if you were to write a bad magician character into a broad comedy, you couldn't do it as well as Kmar did it for himself. The guy was, he was very sweet, but a mess. And everything was always a little bit off. He made terrible mistakes. And Dave was hilarious with him mainly because he really did not like the guy. (laughs) And uh, that was kind of uh, amusing to all of us. So he comes on and he's doing a trick that's called Kmar incinerates David Letterman. And maybe that should have been a tip off to all of us, but uh, he comes for rehearsal. And as I said, Dave is not there and he does the trick and it's kind of like this can goes over Dave's head and then he lights it on fire and you saw it was like birthday candles were coming out of the top so my boss who was Robert Morton who we called Morty who's a very good friend of mine but he was very mean at times uh came to me and he said this is awful this is nothing and then he said to Kmore this sucks uh <laughs> you got to make it bigger you got to make it bigger this is like stupid so Kmart took those words to heart, and before the actual performance on the show, he put an entire bottle of lighter fluid (laughs) and about four packages of flash paper into the can. First of all, the prop was measured wrong, and Dave had to kneel and carry a, like, table on his shoulders, and uh, so it was awkward, to say the least. So now it comes to the part, he puts it down, and now I will incinerate David Letterman, and he lights it, and the thing shoots up about three feet, and there's just flame coming everywhere. So now came our panic, and he's got to put it out. So he starts tamping on it, but his sleeve catches on fire. Oh, no. So he rolls up his sleeve, and he's still tamping it, and... I'm sitting back off the, you know, the side in the production area and I'm thinking, oh my God, my segment is going to disfigure our meal ticket. Like everybody's going to be really unhappy with me. Of course, I made it about myself. So Kmar keeps like tamping it down and now the hair on his arm is singeing and Dave would later say he would smell that. Finally, the stagehands come out, they take, you know, fire extinguishers, they put it out. Dave takes the thing off. He's furious Kmar is banned from the show until six weeks later oh no when a guest falls out and we need him to come back <laughs> and he came you rebooked him oh yeah we rebooked him and Dave was saying it was the scariest feeling because it was like who's the last person in the world you want in charge of this situation <laughs> And it would be Kmar, who's known as being just an incredible screw up. And just the image, if you watch it, it's not that long. But for me, 
it was an eternity. And I still have nightmares, and then I wake up laughing. Oh, because Madeline. Because once you knew it was okay, it was the funniest thing that had ever happened because it really crossed the line of unpredictable. And my entire job there was to walk that line. Yeah. Madeline, who found, who found Larry Bud Melman? Uh, Meryl Marco. Meryl Marco yeah. was the original head writer, invented stupid pet tricks and stupid human tricks. And she saw him in a... Uh, an NYU student film and just decided she wanted him to be our mascot. Meryl's really brilliant. And uh, that the thing that was great about uh, Calvert, DeForest, Larry, Ben Millman was never in on the joke. Never, never. Like never. He was there for how many years? Never got a joke. And so Dave decided that he wanted to use him almost like a, a punching bag and they would try to send him to more and more uncomfortable things. So they sent him to Tierra del Fuego. And I don't really know what the purpose was, but it was just to sort of get him as far away, like geographically possible. And the last stretch of road, he was on local buses. And it was almost sad because we'd go live to him and he would just go, Dave, can I please come home? <laughs> it was like talking to your kid at camp. My Madeline, my favorite still, when if I'm in a bad mood and I get into a YouTube vortex, is when he's at the Statue of Liberty welcoming new re citizens and he pulls the oh, microphone God. away, he starts talking, and he's still talking and he pulls the microphone away. Probably one of the best moments in late night, period. Ever. And Ever. And that is the same with Kmart. Like, if you were to write, send a comedian out and say, do a bit with the mic, it would come out as forced. But yes. that was genuinely where his mind and body were taking him. And it was just, I mean, that clip ended up on every uh, anniversary show with Kmart being cremated. And the one I'll tell you about next time, if yep. you have me back, oh, yeah. which is border collies hurting sheep. Oh, please. I was just going to say, will you please come back? I, I, I really mean that. Will you please come back on the show? I will come back anytime. And when we're it's safe to fly, I'll come in person. Oh, please. I, I, that would mean so much to me. I thank you. Jason, for. Jason, I would love it. Yeah. Thank you for staying. I really appreciate it. Madeline stayed longer than we scheduled her. And I, and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Madinthekitchen.com, everyone. Go check out her website. Oh, that made me. I'm a happy boy right now. Stay right there. We're going to wrap things up when we come back. Back in a moment. <laughs>